Hello, my name is Lynn Hilton Wilson, and I'm thrilled to be able to talk to you about one of my absolute favorite topics, Section 42, The Law of Consecration. My handout for this will be attached right below the link in YouTube to watch the video. So open up the handout for all the information that you'll need there. There are at least 17 sections of the Doctrine and Covenants that refer to this law of consecration and will be added upon, but I've chosen to introduce it here with section 42 because this is the time that was first revealed with great anticipation. The saints had been looking forward to this. Joseph was told, go to Ohio and receive my law, and that's exactly what happened. The main problem that I see with the law of consecration is how the hard questions are concerned are the misunderstandings about it, what it is and what it wasn't and what it will be. I think that this is really important for us now in this dispensation, in this year, to prepare a Zion society for our Savior's second coming. As we are seeing the plagues of the last days poured out upon us, I really hope that we can live more thoroughly the law of consecration. The person that I want to re, um, give the most honor to here for most research on this is Steve Harper. He's absolutely fabulous. He's the current editor of the BYU Studies. He sends so much research on this, and if you want to learn more, just look up Stephen Harper and, uh, at BYU Studies, and you'll get lots more on it. But here are a few questions that I've written up. Why was the law of consecration restored and then revoked? And my answer is it was never revoked, but I'll get into the more detail later. Next question. Why did the law apply only to the land of Missouri? Or does it? Why give it away? It's my stuff. I earned it. Why or when will be asked to live the law of consecration again? Is tithing a lower law of the law of consecration? And does the law of consecration work only in an agricultural community? Is the law of consecration about giving to the poor? Yeah, all of these, I think, are misunderstandings, and I'm really excited to look at the scriptures and see what the Lord revealed to understand better about what we need to be living and what we're held to. Let's start, though, with a very long and broad timetable. We spoke a couple weeks ago about the four missionaries going to Kirtland. That is all in preparation, that the Lord put those in place. Every detail is needed in order for us to be prepared to receive the law of consecration. So our missionaries arriving in Ohio and to teaching the gospel to those people there, the fact that Moses 6 was started to be translated in December of 1830 is part of the Zion of Enoch that then inspired Joseph's thoughts to start looking forward to that day to be restored. In section 37, he's told to take a pause and go to Ohio. All of these are integral to the law of consecration's preparations. It's good to look at the scriptures from the just one perspective. You know, we can look at them from the Joe Smith translation or from the law of consecration or from the topic of revelation or from the topic of the atonement. You know, we just there's so many prisms to look at the Doctrine and Covenants in our church history, and I'd like to today focus on the law of consecration. So I'm reviewing some parts of our history that we did in the past in order to now take a look at them to see how they prepared the way for this sacred law of the celestial kingdom. Section 38, go to the Ohio, and there I will give you my law. January 2nd, that's at the a third church conference that was held in Fayette, New York. Joseph receives that commandment. In February 1st, Emma, Joseph, Sidney, and Edward all arrive in Ohio on a sleigh and pull up in the front of the Whitney store. And at that time, they are trying to decide where the Smiths are going to be living and spending the night. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the tragedy that happens that day when Emma gets in a wagon. And remember, she's, she's five to six months pregnant right now with her twins. I don't know if her twins were early. That's why I keep saying that. Um, I used to work neonatology, so I'm very keen on <laughs> prematurity of the infants when they're twins. February 4th is when the first bishop is called. Our wonderful um, Edward Partridge, the man without guile, section 41 of the Doctrine and Covenants. February 9th, just a few days after they arrive, the law of consecration is restored. The people were prepared. Joseph was prepared. And the Lord was able to teach them the higher law. 1832, March 1st, um, the United Order is organized to oversee the poor and the needy there in Zion. April 23rd, in 1834, Section 104 
refers to the publication of the cooperation of the United Firm, which was that group of people that are going to be using all the surplus coming out of the publishing arm of the church in order to care for, to use for the land, uh, to purchase lands and for the temples, buildings. That then was reorganized later, um, just a few days later, actually. And then by 1838, July 8th, the Lord reveals section 119 that um, talks about the tithing that is all part of the law of consecration. After we have given our surplus, it's then 10% annually. And that same year, 38 in October, is when the extermination order comes. So the saints have left Ohio, gone down to Missouri, and now are being chased out of Missouri. By March of 1844, the year that the prophet dies, just th three three months before his death, Joseph taught in Nauvoo that everyone is a steward over his own property, which is exactly the definition of the law of consecration that I like to keep in my heart and mind every day. Between 1860 and 1883, President Brigham Young and President John Taylor are organizing church cooperations or cooperatives in Utah in order to implement parts of this law. And by 1996, it's the last time I could find it in a general conference report, President Hinckley says, the law of consecration has not been done away with and is still in effect. And I was so glad that he spelled it out so clear because that to me is the largest misunderstanding that we have is that we don't have responsibility of it. Once again, I go back to the thesis that is often attached to Joseph and the restoration, that he is a product of the environment and that the thoughts he projected just came right out of the environment. But the law of consecration, as you can well imagine, had nothing to do with Jacksonian American. As, the, as capitalism is growing, as land is, and purchasing and materialism is growing, um, the idea of anti-private ownership would just make you the laughing stock of, of an area. Now, obviously, those that were reading the Bible, like those who were on the Morley farm um, under Sidney Rigdon's direction of the family, they actually were going against American thought in order to apply the thought of the Bible. But as far as Americans are concerned, the majority of Americans did not have that thought, and certainly not in upstate New York where Joseph was living. The word consecrate means to make sacred. I just want you to let that settle. To become holy, to dedicate something. Joseph receives this definition in order to better understand that our time, talents, and energy are all part of the law of consecration. It's not just a financial law. It's not just a land, a law about our personal property. It's the idea of understanding our relationship to God and acknowledging him as the giver of all of our gifts. Once again, I feel that there is miraculous timing involved and the law of consecration is just almost like the Lord has set up these dominoes in place before that section 42 can be given. And everything is standing in order and they are ready to move ahead. Do you remember when Joseph first starts trancing with Oliver that they start in Mosiah and King Benjamin's sermon is right there. And they have this first wave of information for Oliver. And Joseph, obviously, the year before, had been doing the translation of 116 pages, or months before. But for Oliver, King Benjamin's sermon is the first thing that he's scribing. And the enormous theme coming out, are we not all beggars before God? Impart of your substance one to another. This has been a theme, not only of King Benjamin's, but throughout the Book of Mormon, and part of Joseph's um, entire prophetic life. He and Emma received goods from others repeatedly, starting with Lucy Harris, and then Martin, and then Joseph Knight, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, I should have said starting with his parents. Of course, his parents were living a law of consecration with their children to some degree. The portions that were of the Joseph Smith translation, or Joseph's new um, translation, 
that dealt with Enoch society were translated from December 1830 to February 1831. And the law of consecration was given on February 9th of 1831. Absolutely bullseye timing. You know, it could have been given any time, but the Lord is in the details and the timing is part of the miracle. It's absolutely amazing to me. And do you remember what's written there in Moses 7, 18? We're starting to learn about what a Zion society is. And the Lord is teaching Joseph through the example of these wonderful past prophets. I'm fascinated with how the Lord wants us to have the written record. He wants us to learn from past scriptures. He wants us to learn from the history. Here I am, verse 18. The Lord called his people Zion because they were of one heart and one mind and dwelt in righteousness, and there was no poor among them. Now, if I asked you what was the law of consecration, I hope uh, that you would have quoted this verse, that you would have said um, it's establishing a Zion people with one heart and one mind and no poor. But it is a foundational point. But there is so much more than that that's built upon it. As we continue looking in um, Enoch's writings from Moses 7, 18 to 23, we learn that it becomes a city of holiness. And that when we refer to Zion, we need to think of it in that regard. And holiness, of course, is one of the names of our God. Man of holiness is his name. We learn also in the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis. Continuing on in verses of chapter 7 of Moses, Surely Zion shall dwell in safety forever. But the Lord said unto Enoch, Zion have I blessed. After that, Zion was taken up. And it will not come down until the Savior himself comes down again to rule and reign in glory at the beginning of the millennium. So different people have come up with different numbers on how many words are added. I, I think... I decided to do my own math, and I had um, a statistician sit down with me, and we counted out, and we built a framework, and I really think that this number is accurate. There are many words on um, Enoch, but these are the sections that are not included in the Bible. 4,656 words on Enoch that we do not have in the Bible. Three extra chapters that describe Zion and if we're referring to the Enoch that was taken up to heaven, there are less than 100 words in the Old Testament. The missionary's trip to Ohio was along that timeline of each one of those steps that the Lord had in place. Also, Emma's illness. So she's obviously first sick in the first trimester from her pregnancy and weakened. And then in December, she comes down with a terrible illness and it takes her a long time to regain her strength. But as soon as she is feeling a little bit better, she and Joseph pray for the Lord's will. And Joseph receives the revelation to go to the Ohio where I will give unto you my law. And there you will be endowed with power from on high. So still in her weakened state, um, she and Joseph pack up their bags and leave the idea that is mentioned in several verses, but specifically in verse 32 of section 38, is referring to my law. It doesn't say the law of consecration, my law. I'm fascinated with that. We have the law of Moses as the first five books of Genesis, of Genesis Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Um, they're called the Torah. They're called the Pentateuch. They're called the law. And I... I have to think that Joseph equated my law with Moses's law. I mean, the, every time law is mentioned in the New Testament, it's referring to the law of Moses. Um, I shouldn't say every time. A handful of times it's not. And sometimes it's even the Roman law. <laughs> but the majority of the time, the New Testament refers to the law and the Old Testament refers to the law. It's referring to those five books of Mo that were attributed to Moses, which we know were heavily edited and changed. But this is significant, that there's this tie between Christ as Jehovah revealing to Moses and now our resurrected Lord revealing to Joseph this law. And Joseph is now going to stand in that place as the Lord's vehicle to receive the law. And as you recall, when Moses was on Mount Sinai, the first law that he received was not the Ten Commandments. And that was the Lord's law, that the people were not able to live. They did not have the strength and the faith to enter into the presence of the Lord and learn what was required to enter into the presence of the Lord. They told Moses, you go for us. We're staying down here. 
So Moses goes up. They do not enter into his presence. Only Moses does. And then, of course, um, the, fatted, the fatted calf, the golden calf, and um, Moses breaks the Lord's tablets. And then Moses has to go and make his own tablets, and the Lord gives him the Ten Commandments. But at this time, the Lord is ready to have another people prepared. We are figuratively again at the foothills of Sinai with just a few months of conversion for most of those gathered. And the Lord says, actually in Ohio, it was definitely just a couple of months of conversion. I was thinking of the upstate New York crew that had had a, a, a little bit longer of time of understanding the gospel of Jesus Christ and it's been restored. But the Lord says, I will give you my law, and there you shall be endowed with power from on high. The law is tied to an endowment of power. And living that law is, I believe, in diet. If the priesthood is the power of God on earth, then living the law is also receiving those empowerments and those blessings that come in that greater overarching definition of the priesthood as the power of godliness on earth, which was the endowment of power he's referring to, I believe. In section 41, when Bishop Edward Partridge is first called on February 4th, 1831, the Lord says, and by the prayer of your faith, you shall receive my law. Joseph still has to exert faith. He still has to go before the Lord. And it's not just Joseph alone. He is there with members of the church as well. Joseph was told that he that receiveth my law doeth it, and the same is my disciple. So if we want to be a disciple of Christ, we need to understand this higher law, and we need to live it. And then we are his disciples. So Joseph packs up from Fayette. Emma and Joseph and Sidney and Edward are all in the sleigh for 280 to 300 miles, depending if they're going on the postal roads or the Google Maps roads. And uh, they leave shortly after the church conference. They come up to the Western Reserve. It's now Ohio. Ohio was made a state in 1803. As they come in, um, Sydney, I'm sure, has been talking to them over the last long car ride, uh, long buggy sleigh ride on their experiment with Morley's Farm, or else they had mentioned it before. But, but, but Sydney is having this um, several weeks time to e explain, or a few weeks time to explain to Joseph what was going on. And it's in his mind, and he's been hearing about this um, experiment that they're doing with Acts chapter 2, verse 44. But as the sleigh pulls in, Joseph has seen in vision where they're supposed to stop. And the four of them are packed in and stop right there at the, um, in Kirtland at the Newell K. Whitney store. And I'm sorry that I couldn't find any snow <laughs> pictures of the Newell K. Whitney store. I need to go visit in the wintertime, obviously. But um, this is, you know the story well, I'm sure. Joseph pulls in, he goes inside, and there is Newell K. Whitney. And he says, Newell K. Whitney, thou art the man. And um, prophetically, he knows exactly what's happening. And Sweet, humble, um, Newell K. Whitney says, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, I, you have the advantage of me. I don't know who you are. And he says, I am Joseph the prophet. You prayed me here. Now what can I do for you? And we learned so much about not only the Whitney family, but about the Smith family in this reaction, interaction. And they become dear and fast friends throughout all of Joseph's life. Brother Whitney's partner has a large family and a lovely home or a humble home. And they invite Joseph and Emma to stay there. And Joseph and Emma, it's cold. They've been on this long sleigh ride. And um, for days and days and days, Emma goes and it's noisy and it doesn't um, quite meet her needs. And she requested to not stay there. And then the Whitney's open their home to her and say, would you like to come and see ours? And we'd love to open up a room or two for you. And... Um, she agrees, and that's when um, they move the Smith's belongings from the sleigh into a wagon to go up to the Whitney house. And Joseph is, starts the business, and Emma goes with the belongings just this short distance from the store to the Whitney's home. And um, somehow in the ice and the snow, the wagon overturns and Emma falls out. And um, I don't know if that hurt the twins but it certainly hurt Emma, and it was a difficult beginning. And 
it just reminds me that the promise given to Adam and Eve that there will be pain and thorns in life is the way life is. And just because they are prophets and prophetesses of God, and just because they are restoring the dispensation, and just because the Lord told them to go to Ohio, does not mean that the rooms will be lovely or that the ride will be easy. Um, but it does mean that they are servants of God and they are on his errand and they are doing his work. And um, Emma screamed and Joseph was by her side immediately and um, the Whitney's um, were able to help nurse her back and um, to health for a few days until she regained. Uh, but she was already in a weakened state. I'm sure you can imagine the challenges that were involved in, in that. So we're up to, they drive in on February 1st, February 4th, they move in and get themselves settled. Emma's not doing well. February 4th, Joseph receives the revelation to call wonderful Partridge family to serve him, the Lord, full time as a different kind of bishop than we have. He's the first bishop, but he was a full time servant of God. It's much more like a general authority in our um, book, especially since the church was helping him out. Most of you know he was a professional hatter, and most of you know that they had a little bit of money. And I think it was harder for them to um, enter into a state of poverty than it was for people who were already there and living in that state. But they are um, fabulous examples as the first Latter-day Saints to consecrate their all. And, and we are told in that section 41 that Edward was a, had a pure heart like unto Nathaniel of old a man without guile. I love the fact that Edward was asked the question, how much is all? And Joseph was asked, how much is all? And as we look at the law of consecration, the Lord answers that. Um, but it is never the bishop's responsibility to tell how much is all. It is the individual's responsibility to choose how much they will give. It's always been volunteer, and it's always our decision to know what all means in your individual situation. Now we're up to February 9th, and Joseph is gathered in a room with nine other elders of the church. So the earliest they could have been baptized now is November, December, January, just three months and three days, I think. So very, very young converts. Um, but I think it's interesting that the Lord already has 12 elders gathered there because we see 12 tribes, 12 apostles, 12 moons in the year. God's order is often affiliated with this number, and 12 being the year now that we use in that 12th year when our young men receive the Aaronic priesthood. That is the setting for this great revelation that came, and I assume that for most of those 12, it was the first time they had seen Joseph receive a revelation and some of the times that people recorded what they saw when Joseph restored revelations was that his face shone, that he often said something that alerted the people in the room to get out a pen and paper, or a quill, excuse me, <laughs> to get a quill and ink ready because they needed to record what he said. And that's what happened here. We have lots of eyewitnesses of what happened, and Joseph was able to um, express this beautiful section 42 which became known as the law. I mentioned Stephen Harper earlier. I love the way that he describes the law of consecration. He uses it as a three-legged stool, but I feel that when I read the 17 sections on the law of consecration, that it actually requires four different aspects. That number one is we are given a stewardship. It is, remember back to the parables of Jesus Christ when the, the landowner is away and he has his servants um, given stewardships. And um, at one time they used the idea, one of the parables used the idea of the talents, which was money. He had stewardship over them. And another time it's land that they have to use. And another time it's, it's um, fruits and things that they have to grow. You know, different, different parables all about the same idea. We are given stewardships by God. I have been given a stewardship of membership of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I have been given stewardship of seven wonderful red-headed children. I have been given stewardship of my ward callings as the, as the music director in primary. I have been given a stewardship to be the institute director. I, I feel like um, all of our gifts in life can fall into this category. God, what God has given us is now our responsibility to act according to his will. Um, 
but we have to be accountable to God and we have the agency to either use it wisely or not. It is our choice. Agency is such an important part of the law of consecration. And then the one that I added in that I read regularly is that God esteems all equal. It's not a law for the poor. It's not a law for the rich. It's not a law for any age level. It is a law for all, that it's the mentality that we are God's servants. And we have to turn the social hierarchy upside down. It is not the leaders and the underlings. It's not the um, king and the serfs. You know, it is God and everyone else. And when we realize that and have that mentality, um, then we can better live the law of consecration. Here's just a few scriptural explanations that Joseph received early in February, 1831, Moses chapter seven, verse 18. The Lord called his people Zion because they were one heart, just what we read before. And there was no poor among them. They dwelt in righteousness. Section 42, right here in February 9th, 1831, Thou wilt remember the poor and consecrate of their properties for their support and that which thou hast to impart unto them. Um, Section 78, verse 8. All things be done unto my glory by you who are joined together in this order. The Lord wants us to be able to receive the highest glories and we have got to join together in unity in order to do that in unity, even consecrating our all to the building of the kingdom of God. Section 82, the law of the celestial kingdom is the law of consecration. And in 105, he continues on restoring more information to Joseph. You cannot build up Zion unless it is by the law of the celestial kingdom. Now that is our responsibility now. We are to prepare the time for the second coming. We are to make sure that the bridegroom is ready to receive her groom. And if we are not ready, if we are not living the law of consecration, we are not ready. Here are the other revelations. Uh, I've got them on our handout too, so you can read them a little more slowly. But the information is just beautiful. The way the Lord taught line upon line, precept by precept, here a little and there a little. How these little organizations were formed for monetary needs and how organizations are formed for emotional needs. I look at our ministering, is the heart of that is the law of consecration. We are to care and work together and serve those under our jurisdiction and learn to serve with love and go far beyond a tenth or something, but we give our all. I love this message of the storehouse of the bishop, that we take our goods and we put them there. And there's so many fabulous stories in church history about the different storehouses and people bringing in their wood and their eggs and their cream and everything else as they tried to live this law in the early parts of the church when there was not a lot of financial backing but sharing of kind. They established an independent storehouse in Zion, so they're living the law of consecration to some degree, the best they can, in both Kirtland and in Missouri. Actually, it wasn't the best they could. That was the problem. It wasn't the best they could. They were living it to some degree, but they were not living it with exactness. And as we learned in the first vision, Joseph got in trouble when he didn't follow with exactness, and the Lord needs his stewards to follow him exactly in order for it to work out. Remember, in addition to these 17 sections, that the law of consecration was also implemented and added to the endowment that Joseph revealed to the saints in the upstairs of the red brick store in 1842, shortly after the organization of the Relief Society, or in conjunction, I should say, rather than shortly afterward. Um, Initially, he just endowed the men, but he was organizing the Relief Society to work hand in hand so that those sisters would become priestesses in the temple and be able to serve in that regard. In section 52, there are five questions. And I pointed this out because I wanted to emphasize some of the hard questions about this law of consecration. The first one in, in verses one through 10, should the church come together in one place or remain as they are in separate bodies? And in our day and age, it's a different answer than it was then. But you know it then was to gather. And now we gather in our wards and our stakes, and we gather in our hearts and in our minds and in our pocketbooks. What is the law regarding the church in her present situation till the time of her gathering? You know, Joseph asks questions and the Lord answers them. And may we sometimes 
find our answers in scriptures and sometimes on our knees and sometimes while we're working. This section of 42 verses 70 to 73 it tells the, the priesthood holders their obligations to the church that owes to their family while they are fulfilling their obligations to the church. And how does that work there? Section 42 verses 74 to 77, how to act in cases of adultery. And then in 78 to 93, how the elders are to act according to some points in the revealed law. Joseph begins by saying, hearken, and you know he uses this word so often. In fact, in this section, it's 31 times, and um, my colleague um, Taylor Halverson has a great podcast on this one, but just, just circle them, just circle them, and think in your mind, listen and obey. Um, You know, he starts off the Doctrine and Covenants like this as well. The Lord wants us to listen and obey in this um, section, and obviously, 31 times to give us that message. Section 45 that discusses the people of Enoch, right? You know, the Lord just flows more and more information that came out of Joseph's translation and then revelations that allowed us to implement it as we see in verses 11 through 13 of 45. Going back to section 42, verse 18 to 28, if you count them out, if you go through and underline them, um, we have a list of, of the Ten Commandments there as well. The law of consecration is not saying we don't need to live the Ten Commandments. It is in addition to, but those are part of the law. When Christ is teaching in the New Testament, we find almost all of the Ten Commandments regularly in, in his sermons as well. And we see right here in section 42 with the higher law, a repetition of Moses's Ten Commandments, and I'm sorry for choosing this picture with these funny little horns, but for those of you art historians, you already know that um, Moses was often portrayed with um, little horns because it's described in the scripture by having shiny, his face is shiny, and a pillar of light coming down, and so they have the horns as the beings of light that are coming off, and they just look like horns, but I should have chosen a different piece of artwork there. I love um, verse 29 in section 42 as they emphasize that as well. But the law of consecration is also based on this. As we look at the Ten Commandments, the first four are about loving God. Just go through them really quickly. Thou shalt have no other God before you. Don't take his name in vain. Keep the Sabbath day holy is number four. Number three is vain. Number two, I got I got them in the wrong order. I'm sorry about that. But they're all four about loving God. And then the others, starting with honoring your father and mother, and then don't kill, don't commit adultery, all the way down to coveting. Um, Those are all about loving your neighbor. And the center of the Old Testament, the center of the law is found in Leviticus 19.18. And this, the chiastic center of the Torah is to love your neighbor. And the Shema, which was recited every morning in your families, every day at the temple, at the hour of prayer, and at sunrise by the priests from Deuteronomy 6, 5. It calls on God's people to love God. The the law, the Ten Commandments are based on loving God and loving your neighbor. And then when we add the law of consecration, we need to also add Christ's higher law, which was given at the Last Supper, to not just love as we love, but to love as Christ loves. You know, that's an enormous step. And for me, it is the most beautiful aspect of loving. Don't judge other people. Don't say, I wouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing that. L- pray to the Lord that you can see these people in the way that he does. And John thirteen thirty four describes our new commandment. Going back to section 42, After we discuss the Ten Commandments a while, in verse 54, it says, If thou obtainest more than that which would be for thy support, thou shalt give it unto my storehouse. If you've got extra, let's share it. And all these things may be done according to that which I have said. I think every spring cleaning, we clean out our closets. If we've got too much, let's take it down and share it um, with other people. Joseph Smith later said, as recorded in the letter book of the Joseph Smith Papers, a man is bound by the law of the church, meaning the law of the consecration, to consecrate to the bishop before he can be considered a legal heir to the kingdom of Zion. Joseph wanted everyone going to Missouri to be willing to live this law, and this too without constraint. And unless he does this, he cannot be acknowledged before the Lord on the church book. 
Um, those that went to Zion, th those went to Missouri um, in 1830 and beyond, 1831, excuse me, and beyond, were called to live this law. And unfortunately, um, they did not keep their end of the deal. One of those who did this was Titus Billing, and we have actual his record, which is so dear, as he's in Jackson County, Missouri. Be it known that I, Titus Billing of Jackson County, do of my own will and record give two beds, bedding, extra clothing, valued $73.25, also farming utensils valued at $41, also one horse, two wagons, two cows, two calves, valued at $147 for the purpose of purchasing land in Zion, in Jackson County, Missouri, and building up the New Jerusalem, even Zion. Isn't that awesome? We've got other records of people who did the same thing um, later at other times, and they give everything they have. I have a wife, I have children, I have a little bit of food, I'll give it all to the kingdom. And then the bishop writes back, I give you stewardship over your wife and your children and all that you have to build the kingdom. You know, it's taking what we have, being willing to share it, and being willing to do whatever God asks us to do with our time, talents, and energy. Okay, follow that arrow, and you can probably follow along and read these words from the Joseph Smith Papers. Every man must be his own judge, how much he should receive and how much he should suffer to remain in the hands of the bishop. We are to be accountable and we have our agency. Section 119 is, I referenced a little bit earlier, this is a few years later, this is when it has not been working. Joseph has had a very difficult time. And I keep reminding myself, Enoch had three, over 300 year, 350 years to get his people prepared before they were translated. And poor Joseph is dealing with brand new converts who have the mentality of an American Jacksonian materialistic view of land and property. We're in a very greedy world at this time because there's land available. They've stolen it from other, or they've purchased it, quote unquote, the Louisiana purchase, etc. So it's hard. It's hard to live it now, and we've been members a lot more than a few months. O oh Lord, show unto thy servants how much thou requirest of the properties of thy people. You know, what does all mean? How much do you want me to give you? Verily thus saith the Lord, I require all their surplus property. Now, this is the beginning of the law of tithing. This is, I'm just quoting this section. Um, we misread it if we think it's, it's just a penny for every dime. The Lord asks us to give our alls. And when that went awry, in the case of W.W. W. Phelps, Joseph gave him a gentle reminder, quote, you say, my press, my type, where, our brother asked, did you get them? And how came they to be yours? No hardness, but caution. For you know that it is we, not I, and all things are the Lord's. And he opened the hearts of his church to furnish these things, or we should not have been privileged with using them. The press was purchased out of the tithes of the church. And just because he's the publisher does not mean that he has ownership. And I just love that reminder and that caution. Joseph also published in the Lectures on Faith more about the law of consecration. We read in 1834's edition, the religion that does not require the sacrifice of all things never has power sufficient to produce the faith necessary to lead unto life and salvation. This is a law that we need to incorporate. In 1836, the Painesville, Ohio Telegraph said that there was an enormous influx and emphasis in time of the properties going. More and more people are moving west and the prices are just skyrocketing. There's terrible inflation. They say, quote, a certain piece of property which sold four or five weeks since for 10,000 was sold last Monday for 20,000. The present proprietor has refused 25,000. A large number of other lots, some of which sold for $10 per foot two or three months since, are now selling from $50 to $70 a foot. This is the society that Joseph is trying to introduce the law of consecration. Very, very difficult. But just like tithing, the law of consecration is not about money or quantity. The law of consecration is about love and our focus and work. It is everyone working to build the kingdom, and we all work the best we can, depending on the stewardships that God has given us with our time and talents and energy. Consecration changes our daily work into holiness. 
If we consecrate whatever we do during the day, it becomes a sacred space and part of living the law of consecration. I love this by Elder Maxwell. Consecration is giving all we have for all the Father has. What an exchange rate. You know, just think of your duplex or your car or your bicycle or your, your iPhone, uh, all the Father has. And I mentioned that President Hinckley referred to this. I could have included President Romney, who spoke on it often, and other general authorities who have mentioned the law of consecration throughout the history of the church, which you are free to look up as well. But this one from 1996 states, the law of sacrifice and the law of consecration have not been done away with and are still in effect. The, the prophet did not want us to have these misunderstandings that this was done away with. A few years ago, I think it was 2017, my son was working at Google, and Elder Anderson and Elder Bednar came to visit the uh, Google and Facebook, actually, both at two different visits. They, two different groups came, and they wanted to learn what they could do to apply in the church. And they met with the employees of the, of the church that worked at Google at that time, where my son did. And President Elder Bednar told them, you may receive your paycheck from Google, but never forget that you work for the Lord. I believe with all my heart that the Lord is my boss. And as we look at the law of consecration, let us remember who is our God and whom we serve and who gives us the breath of life, let alone a roof over our head and a little porridge. Some of the misunderstandings that I have heard from my students and others is that it is currently not required. We are not required to live the law, that it's a law about money, that it's a socialism kind of a thing, that it was for the people of Missouri and we will relive it again when we are called to Missouri, that it is a lower law than the law of tithing, that it can only be really be practiced in agricultural communities like um, Brigham and President um, Taylor tried, that it was rescinded or revoked, um, that philanthropy is the same thing, all of these are wrong. Not one of these are right. Now, yes, the poor do receive things. And yes, it was used in Missouri. And yes, there are other communal lifestyles. Um, but just because you earned it does not mean it's yours. Who taught you to work? And who gave you arms and legs and a mind to do your jobs? Consecration is not these things. Philanthropy is good. Work is good. Giving to the poor is good. But the law of consecration is building the kingdom of God with what God has given us. It is doing God's bidding. It is honoring God as our Father and His Son as our Redeemer. And it's doing their work on their time schedule. And I believe as we strive to live this more and more every day of our lives, that there will be many, many, many more challenges ahead. But Christ cannot come until His people, the bride, is ready. And living the law of consecration is absolutely required. I love the law of consecration. And I love section 42. And I hope as you read it, you will feel the Spirit of the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you.